Someone once told me that technology is anything invented after you were born. Now, I have been immersed in technology my entire life. It began with the TRS-80 from Radio Shack, which was the only computer in my elementary school, the Ethel McKnight School. And having one computer back then was a big deal. Fast forward to when my brother and I asked our parents for a video game. They got us a Commodore VIC-20, which we hated. Because we wanted Atari. I'm dating myself. From there, I would, I would go on to study engineering at Rutgers, computer science at Oxford, media technology at MIT, and today I sit as the chairman and CEO of BCT Partners, a management consulting and information technology consulting firm headquartered right here in Newark at NGIT's Enterprise Development Center. But I have had, across my career, a front row seat to the explosion of digital technology. You know, from iPods to iPhones to iPads to iTunes, sometimes I wish that I had some eye time for eye peace and eye quiet so I could get some eye sleep. Somebody said I heard that. But it has been an explosion. Here I have a slide that shows you the number of years it's taken various technologies to reach 25% market share, 25% of the U.S. population. And from the airplane that took 54 years for 25% of our population to fly on an airplane, to the internet, which took seven years, as you can see, technology is being incorporated into our lives at a much faster and faster rate of adoption. And so we have benefited from technology. But it begs the question, what have we learned from technology? And so I want to speak to you about things that I can say confidently. And what I can say confidently is that I have learned very little in my role as a consumer of technology. That I've learned very little as someone who points and clicks and downloads and consumes. But by comparison, I've learned some tremendous lessons, some valuable life lessons as a producer of technology, somebody who designs and invents and creates and produces technology. And the good news this evening is that everyone can be a technology producer, whether it's because the tools have become so simple and so straightforward that whether you're creating a website or a blog or an application, everyone has an entry point nowadays. So I want to speak to you this evening to the theme, Technologies, Lessons for Life. Technologies, Lessons for Life. Now, one of the lessons I've learned from technology is that oftentimes there is more than one answer to a question, more than one solution to a problem. Now, I'll never forget my first exam in engineering. In high school, I had a habit of going to the easiest question first to get myself acclimated to the exam, to the test, kind of work myself in. So I got my engineering exam and I pulled it out and I'm flipping through the pages, looking for the easy question and it was nowhere to be found. It was nowhere. Because that exam asked of me what technology challenges of all of us. First, to take what you've learned someplace and apply it elsewhere, but also, Technology challenged me to say that I am going to not just find the right answer, but rather I'm going to find an answer. That there is more than one way to build a computer, more than one way to design a cell phone, more than one way to build an application. There's no right answer. There's lots of answers. And what that professor was looking for was not so much the answer, but how you thought about the problem unto itself. In fact, some questions he told us, he didn't expect us to find a solution. Gee, thanks. And so, this reminds me of the two applicants for a job. One a technology producer, one a technology consumer. And they both had to take an exam to determine who will get the job. 
So they take the exam, and the hiring manager comes back into the room. They're seated next to each other and says to them, you both got nine right, and you both got one wrong. But we're going to give the job to the technology producer. Now, of course, the consumer says, well, how can that be that you are going to give the job to the producer when we both got nine right and one wrong? And the hiring manager says, it's very simple. Well, to question number seven, the technology producer said, I don't know. And you wrote, neither do I. <laughs> the lesson being that we need not look over somebody else's shoulder, believing that they have the right answer, but rather we must bring our own creativity, our own identity, our own personality, our own style to what we do, and knowing that there is more than one answer to the question, and there's more than one solution to the problem. The second lesson I've learned from technology is that disciplinary boundaries are artificial. That the boundaries, the very sharp and defined boundaries that we draw between, say, the humanities and science, or the arts and mathematics, are artificial. That we have constructed these boundaries as a way to understand the world, but at the end of the day, they're man-made, they're woman-made, they're an artifact of how we construct the world. And as a function of that, we can often miss and lose sight of the fact that the world is fundamentally interdisciplinary. We're getting ready to launch a mobile application development center here in Newark. My firm, BCT Partners, in partnership with NJIT and BCDC and many others. If you think about the technology of a mobile application, it forces you to draw upon multiple disciplines in order to do it well. A mobile app will require of you to understand visual arts, to build a good user interface. It'll draw upon psychology to understand how the user will interface with the application. It will draw upon computer science for the underlying operating system or programming language. It will draw upon liberal arts to understand the context in which the application will be used. And of course, it will draw upon engineering to understand exactly how to build, deploy, and test the application. And so what technology challenges of us, if you are a producer of technology, is to understand that these disciplines are indeed artificial. And in fact, it's a way of thinking that I believe harkens back to when we were children. If you think about when you were young, you didn't say things like, I'm not a math person, or English has never been my thing, or even better, the jungle gym's never been my thing, or the seesaw is kicking my butt. I mean, you don't say these kinds of things when you're young. That language emerges as you grow older, as you begin to believe that we have to make choices between one thing or the other as opposed to embodying what I call the power of and, the power of A and D. That when you were a child, it wasn't about rationalizing whether you could do this or this or that. It was about conceptualizing how you could do this and this and that. I'll use myself as an example. I told you before when I was young, I was into technology. When I, I told my parents I wanted to play a video game, they said, if you want to play a video game, you have to make the video game. Gee, thanks. And so my brother and I did it. We learned how to program, and we did, we, we did and designed games in elementary school. Crazy. But also when I was young, I was into entrepreneurship. I sold lemonade. I know that's played out now. I sold candy in the halls of my high school. I even tried to sell my toys to other kids in my neighborhood, but they were broke, <laughs> so it wasn't quite the enterprising endeavor. In fact, then my mother found out and said, you can't sell the toys. I bought the toys. If you're going to sell them, at least give me a cut. I told her no. And so she shut down my toy store. <laughs> I just shut the whole thing down. But the point is, the third interest I had, community service, like Lanier, how to transform communities. And so rather than believing that I had to do technology or entrepreneurship or community service, today I stand before you as somebody who has a technology business that serves the community. That's the power of and. And the lesson I've learned from technology as a producer in thinking about breaking down 
disciplinary walls that you need not think about your interests as existing in distinct separate spheres, that you can find harmony between your talents in the law and your desire to transform communities. You can find harmony in your skills in engineering and your passion for hip-hop. You can find harmony between your gifts as a teacher and your desire to change lives. That you can find harmony between what might be seemingly disconnected disciplines and bring them back into the harmony for which they were always destined. And that's beautiful. The third and final lesson I've learned from technology is that if you're going to fail, fail fast. If you're going to fail, fail fast. There's a certain culture around technology development. It's a culture of rapid prototyping, of iteration, of trial and error, of experimentation, of rolling out a prototype and then a beta version and then a version 2.0 and issuing releases and a very rapidly moving iterative process, which teaches you that if you're going to fail, fail fast, because if you fail fast, you get to success faster. Because Success is literally predicated on a foundation of failure. That if you desire to be successful, failure is ultimately unavoidable. And there are success stories, tremendous success stories, that are riddled with failure. By a show of hands, how many of you have ever heard of WD-40? How many of you know the story of WD-40? See, by four hands. WD-40 was established by three staff people in San Diego in 1953 who set out to create a line of rust prevention solvents, degreasers for the aerospace industry. It took them 40 attempts to get the formula right. 40 attempts. WD-40 stands for water displacement perfected on the 40th try. It gets better. And by a show of hands, how many of you have ever heard of Formula 409? I'm not making this up. I got it off Wikipedia. <laughs> Formula 409, founded by two scientists in Detroit, set out to create the ultimate cleanser. It took them 409 attempts to get the formula right. 409, I'd have given up on the 10th try. Not have given up on the 100th try. No, wait, I'm sorry. I'd have given up on the 300th try. No, wait, I would have thrown in the towel on the 408th try. 409, that is bananas. <laughs> but the lesson in those stories, even my firm, BCT Partners, it is mine and my partner's fifth venture. What happened to the previous four ventures? They failed. Some failed miserably. But the lesson is, don't let a setback hold you back because a setback is a setup for a comeback. If there is no risk, there's no reward. There's no pain, there's no gain. If there is no struggle, there's no progress. If there is no test, there is no testimony. If there is no trial, there is no triumph. If there are no problems, there is no power. If there is no disappointment, there is no discipline, which means sometimes you have to go through in order to grow through which means that there's nothing ventured, there is nothing gained. So go hard or go home. If you don't believe, then don't bother because failure isn't falling down, failure is staying down. Do you hear me, TEDxNJIT? Do you hear me? <laughs> or stated more succinctly, to win without risk is to triumph without glory. So these are some of the lessons that I've learned from technology as a producer of technology, recognizing that everyone today can be a producer, that oftentimes there's more than one answer to the question, more than one solution to the problem, that disciplinary boundaries are artificial. And that if you're going to fail, fail fast. But remember, these are not lessons that I've learned 
as a consumer of technology, but as a producer of technology. That consumers change very little in our society. For it is producers who drive innovation and drive change. Reminds me of this last story I'll tell you. I have two cousins, teenagers, came to visit me a few years ago. They arrived on a Friday, came into my home, made themselves comfortable. By Saturday morning, they came downstairs, looked me in my eye, and told me, we're bored. I said, excuse me? They said, we're bored. I said, whoa, 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 wait a second. You mean to tell me you came into my house with all these gadgets and gizmos? You've got CDs, you've got DVDs, you've got iPods with MP3s, you've got an Xbox, a Game Boy, a GameCube, you've got a Wii, you've got an XM radio, a laptop, a desktop, you've got HD TV with two billion channels. And you tell me you're bored? So you know what? Go outside and you do what I did when I was a kid. Go outside and find a can and kick it until you like it. I said, go outside and play dodgeball or freeze tag or stoop ball. And don't come back into my house until you like it. And guess what? They never came back. <laughs> but the lesson or the message that I endeavored to send to them is the message that I'm here to share at TEDxNJIT, which is that we must promote more active forms of engagement than passive ones in this age of technology everywhere. That we must not, we must learn the lessons from technology and not lessen the learnings from technology. And in fact, we must position ourselves not as consumers, passive consumers of technology, but as active producers to learn those lessons. God bless you, and thank you.